Section two of Christmas Comes But Once a Year by John Layton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The twenty fifth of December arrives. The festival of the year has come. Christmas Day commences with the rising of the cook, who finish the evening kneading and gaping over pies and puddings, and wakes with the same operation gaping and kneading her eyes, which do not fairly open until she comes to look after her first care, the pudding. The fire, having been made up overnight, is discovered a beauty, but, behold, within the copper the pudding has dissolved. There is nothing to be found but a cloth, which must have been boiling all night in a rich plum soup, the string having come untied, or rather never been tied at all, but popped in by Mrs. B. without attending to that operation, a piece of neglect for which the cook gets warning, and all the servants rated, until the bells of St. Stiff's remind Mrs. B. that it is time to depart for the duties of a Christian to eschew all the vanities of this wicked world, in a rich purple Genoa velvet paletot and duck of a plum bonnet. That day Mr. Churchwarden Brown's pew would not hold all, so Mrs. Strap, the pew-opener, had to manoeuvre by appropriating part of another to their use, losing her Christmas box for the offence against its owner, Mr. Din the coppersmith. Mr. Spoaf's Christmas hymn is much liked, and is really so fine as to make that essence of gentleness himself temporarily egotistical. He wonders what impression it has made upon Miss Jemima and the strange gentleman who is so attentive to her. Could he do as much? But Mr. Latimer de Camp is heedless of other good things flying about him, for upon the walk home after service, among the savoury Christmas dinners that are hurrying in every direction, he is so abstracted as to find a sucking pig in his stomach, and not a little gravy spilt upon his trousers, compelling him to change them upon his arrival at home for a neat pair of young browns. Mr. Spoaf having played all out of St. Stiff the Martyr, walks home moodily. Instead of finding his dinner as usual, the chop and potato, he learns that his landlord, Mr. Strap the Greengrocer, has stopped the supplies. It is quarter day. Strap thinks of the five weeks' arrears and Mr. Spoaf's inability to pay for his lodgings. So Mr. and Mrs. Strap have surprised him by preparing a huge leg of mutton and pudding, for they know he does not, as of old, go to the willer. After this humble repast, which was relished as much as any could be, and was far less likely to leave unpleasant sensations than if it had been more costly, they draw round the fire and Master Ichabod Strap, one of the choristers of St. Stiff the Martyr, is playing with a shilling, polishing the coin upon his sleeve. It is the identical one said to have been put in the plate by Captain de Camp, and given by Mr. Flintflayer, the gentleman who held the Gothic platter, to Mrs. Strap, the pew-opener, advising her at the same time to nail it to the counter, a counterfeit to deter smashers but somehow the coin seemed doomed to remain unholy, for no orifice or artifice could have rendered it a lucky one. It was shown to Mr. Spoaf, who thought it bad, and that it might have gotten into the plate by mistake. Mrs. Strap knew it bad, an intentional perpetration, and, like the giver, not worth a dump. Mr. Strap not only thought it bad, but proved it so, for after having spun, sounded, and eaten a portion of it, he cast the coin into the glowing fire, where the silver quickly changed, dropping like quicksilver among the ashes, to be picked out by Ichabod, 
very unlike a sterling coin. Old Strap, who had taken the pledge, but since introduced an exceptional clause in favour of feasts and festivals, gets out the black bottle for fraternity's sake. They take a pipe apiece, and so softened is the little organist with their genuine unsophisticated kindness that he sees all his cares fly, and nothing but joys in the wreathed curls of smoke betaking themselves up the chimney. He sees Messrs. Blow and Grumble, the eminent organ-builders, making a fortune by his new movement, having purchased and patented it. He has found a publisher for his church music, and sold his old opera. Captain de Camp has vanished in smoke. He has exploded of spontaneous combustion. They find him all deceit, leaving a glass eye and a cork leg. Mr. Latimer gets the colonial bishopric of Bushanti in New Zealand and cuts Miss Jemima. Mr. Wellesley, having gone to India for glory, returns with it, a hook and a patch over his eye. Miss Angelina vows to die a virgin. Mr. Brown says to Mr. Spoaf, My son! Mr. Spoaf says to Mr. Brown, My father! Mr. Strap is standing in triumph upon a pyramid of carpets to beat, viewing a lesser one of boots to brush, having been entrusted with more messages than mortal ever could deliver, whilst innumerable vans bearing the name of Strap traverse innumerable roads in town and country. Mrs. Strap, dressed in a plain plum silk, turns a mahogany mangle, and gets up nothing but fine things. Ichabod has cut the choir, and made his debut in an opera as Herr Strappy, a perfect triumph. But here we will leave Mr. Spoaf's reverie, for Victoria and reality, where the company is arriving to the annual dinner, and sitting about the drawing-room, looking as happy as patients at a dentist's, or festive as disappointed toad-eaters at the funeral of an opulent relative who had left all his property to found an asylum for decayed post-boys, after leaving everybody to expect the lion's share of it. The guests, for want of more exciting topics, admiring the Jim Cracks they admired a year ago, thinking the portrait of Mr. Brown, done twenty years since at a portrait club, a splendid likeness, and that the original grows younger, query richer, stating truths and untruths about the weather, inquiring energetically after each other's health, not caring for the answers with other homely pleasantries too numerous to mention, until some of the juveniles, the only ones who really seem at home, espy from the window a loaded parcel cart. This they observe as funny on a Sunday, little thinking at that moment it was Tuesday. Here Mr. Brown descends to hold an altercation with the guard of that cart, who makes light of a huge hamper of game, whilst the guests at the windows above speculate upon having to eat an uncooked turkey, or fancy their ravenous appetites waiting while it is cooked, the youngsters calculating upon a dinner all pudding. Mr. Brown returns and tenders his arm to Lady Lucretia de Camp, in the excitement leading her down the side where the stairs taper to nothing, causing that lady to lose both equilibrium and temper. In the hall they are introduced to the viands all thought to partake of, which have arrived too late, and are now displayed in their primitive state, a picture of still life, whilst the guests, a picture of disappointment, have to put up with odds and ends concocted to meet the emergency, ending with a series of plum dumplings in place of the legitimate large pudding. However, the indigent relatives, who prefer the cold corners, and take any part, 
declare themselves well satisfied, all partaking of everything and brandy afterwards, as if the viands were rich. Master Brown does justice to everything, of course. That sweet child is now pulling the merry thought with his maiden aunt. He is victor, and, as no one wishes to know his thoughts, seems determined to tell them, wishing, Jemmy and Mr. Latimer would look sharp and knock up the match Mamma spoke of, as then he should be breached, have pockets and money. Here the little dear turned to the captain, saying, You'll give me a crown, won't you? A question at which the maiden aunt blushed intensely, as did Mrs. Brown, who attempted to hide her emotion by saying, What strange things children do think of! At the same time helping a gentleman who had had enough, the bashful gentleman who sat at the junction of the tables, and appeared so incommoded by the table-land of one being higher than the table-land of the other, causing his plate to oscillate in a very remarkable manner, and discharge its contents in his lap, the conjoined legs compelling him either to sit at a fearful distance and spill the gravy, or to split his kerseymeres by extending them too much for their frail mate. However, he has at last succeeded in thrusting one knee between them and the shorter leg of the two off Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress used to stilt it, letting the unfortunate gentleman's pudding down and his plate travel until at last it stops, performing a gyration all to itself under the sideboard. During this clatter the ladies rise and depart, leaving the gentlemen to drown all disappointments in the wine. Mr. Brown, feeling called upon, rises, apologising for certain misfortunes herein described, at the same time trusting that such events might never happen again, and in the end eulogising Mrs. B., who is painted in glowing colours by a painter who said he should not have painted it, or, as any one else might have observed, introduced two virtuously amiable daughters so prominently in the foreground. After a noble reply by Captain de Camp of the Honourable East India Company's service from Madras, and much applause from the diners, they ascend to join the ladies, forming round the drawing-room fire a vast amphitheatre, in the centre of which gladiatorial children contend for nuts and oranges, Captain de Camp filling the post of honour, making himself at home in Mr. Brown's easy-chair and slippers. Mr. Wellesley drags in the yule log, much to the detriment of the Brussels and the annoyance of the guests for upon placing it in the grate it causes everything to be covered with black tadpoles nearly extinguishing the fire until it ignites roasting the company and making the pot a white heat the captain has repeated last evening's brew upon a larger scale in the little basin or wassail bowl master wellesley has kissed angelina under the mistletoe suspended from the chandelier, and placed in the centre of the amphitheatre for that purpose. Mr. Latimer has taken the opportunity, as Jemima turned up a refractory burner, and everybody kissed everybody else they liked, or could catch, there. The entertaining captain has narrated an effective anecdote of an enraged elephant, and a precious big boar speared in a savage jungle, to which he might have added, with no more personal risk, than Mrs. Brown may experience when hunting for a boa in her wardrobe. And Mr. Mouldy, the city merchant who dealt in rags, sang about a little excitable pig, and Mac Mullins' lament, whilst Mr. Snobbins, who it was hoped would sit and be silent, has broken the spell dared to remember old times, sleeping under a counter, and the pugnacity of Brown when they were in a mess at the Blues, 
making Captain de Camp think more of a military repast than Christ's hospital, until the blues were dispelled by Mr. Snobbin singing The Gallant Prentice Boy. Not that the company would have lacked a military man had the captain been absent, for there was Coward, the meek Bermondsey Tanner, by livery a hatter, and withal a soldier, a member of the Honourable Artillery Company, he who sang about God blessing the old cow's hide, and a uh, wish that his soul in heaven might dwell who first invented the leather bottle. And Mrs. Brown's brother, Mr. Bartha Brick, familiarly known as THE Brick, who had just commenced a song, a parody upon Fra Diavolo, a something very, very low, supposed to be sung by a dealer in hearthstones, who at the end of each verse vociferates, Who'll buy? heightening the illusion by trundling a chair on its back round the family circle to represent a barrow. No one knows where the barbarous atrocities would have ended, and all before the refined strangers too, had not the olive branches, disposed for rest by their several mamas in the room above, all awoke at once, tumbled out of bed, and joined in a combined cry. This breaks the family circle. Mothers fly to pack their turbulent innocence for travel. The candles flare and carriages clatter, grinding the flints in the lane. John the footman finds he has a dozen half-crowns and Mary seven. The last fly has departed with the little bricks. Lights appear and disappear in the bedchambers, and the Christmas day that comes but once a year, has vanished like a dream. Mr. Brown has jotted the events in his diary in a hand scarcely legible. It must have been penned in a somnambulistic fit, thinking he was at a meeting of St. Stiff's Vestry in the Union Boardroom, for after a list of members present, the names of his guests, Captain de Camp in the chair, follow these minutes of proceedings. Firstly, that one spoof be dismissed as organist of St. Stiff's, confined in the idiot ward, fed on water gruel, and handed over to his own parish, Vienna, proposed by Latimer and seconded by Wellesley de Camp. The second proposition appears to be to the effect that a vagrant named Brick, dealer in hearthstones, be confined in the refractory ward and fed upon bread and water. End of section 2